I think no matter what level you end up getting to, better is always the answer. And better is what you should be going after. You shouldn't just be settled for this. Now, what, you know, quote unquote, better gets you to or how much faster it gets you or what, you know, what place on the podium it gets you or do you get lucky enough to get a slot to to Kona? Like, you know, those are like those are a lot of things like really just out of your control. You there, buddy? Hey, sorry about that. I was, uh, I was on hold. Oh, Skype hold. No, I was just on hold in general, waiting on fall to get here. Oh my <laughs> god, dude. It's like brutal outside. It is insane. Fall is not here, but we're here. Welcome aboard. Christian Iron Podcast, episode 303. 303 is correct. Love it. That this, is a weird sounding number. Again. It is a weird, it is a very weird sounding number. Uh, but hey, I'm Coach Robbie. That's Mike. Uh, again, this is the Crushing Iron Podcast. We come to you twice a week, usually Monday and Thursday, uh, but definitely twice a week, regardless of the day. And uh, we cover all things triathlon, race recaps, race reviews, uh, a guest here and there. But for the most part, we really just do our best to kind of share our uh, uh, experiences uh, through both uh, competing as athletes and as coaches. And uh, if we can share anything that helps you avoid any of our pitfalls or obstacles, then uh, that's really the name of the game. But the, the biggest thing we try to do is really hopefully uh, get across some of the ways we've found to incorporate triathlon in life and how they intersect and dealing with them and in the best way possible. Uh, we don't have all the answers, but we, we have plenty of experiences. And if you can take one ounce of those and apply it to your life in a positive way, then, hey, we'll consider that a, uh, a big win. Big win. And I consider myself a good guinea pig for all this stuff. You, you, <laughs> you, have, uh, you have been my, uh, you know, my lab rat slash your own lab rat here for the last going on seven years. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I haven't uh, been back to big, the whiteboard yet. But... What's That's that? That's okay. I said I was speaking of big wins. The uh, Tennessee Vols beat their longtime in-state rival uh, Chattanooga on Saturday to get our first <laughs> win in the win column. We're now one and two. Dude, I uh, saw that. I turned the game on in like the second quarter. It was forty to nothing or something. I didn't watch a single down. Well, um, so maybe that's the way to do it. That is. I think we had actually uh, a huge water main break in Chattanooga on Friday morning, uh, and so the whole like downtown and some of the sort of like surrounding areas that touch downtown were were with totally without water until midday Saturday. Um, and then we're still on like a, I think like a boil advisory. Oh so no, just, is this to cancel the swim? Uh, no, nah, no, nah, no, nah, it's all going to get fixed. However, it's been so freaking hot here that um, it is definitely going to be, I would say, borderline what's too legal. I haven't done a water temp test, obviously, because I'm not racing. But uh, it has been so hot here as it has been for most of the South and other places. Definitely not fall temps, but uh, yeah, it's still in like the 90s this week. But I think towards the end of this week, the weather's supposed to cool down here in Chattanooga. So if you're racing, hopefully that's a good sign. And and then uh, the next week will be even cooler because it's been like straight 90s um, for everyone. But you're about a week into your recovery from Ironman Wisconsin. How are you feeling? I feel pretty good, but you know I haven't really done much. That's the problem. I mean, that's not that's not really a problem. Not a problem. I've I've done a lot of uh, walking around. You know. I think that's pretty much what you should be doing. I I generally have like a two week ban on running after uh, after Ironman. I think people will try to run like way too quick. Yeah, um, they do. They want to redeem themselves. <laughs> I it crossed my mind a lot this action. week. Hmm? Uh, and so yeah. But uh, everyone is uh, either getting recovered from big races or gearing up more for races like we talked about, Ironman Chattanooga, Louisville, Arizona, Florida, Maryland. There is a – there's a lot. There's a lot coming up. It's a fun time of year. Athletes getting ready to race and athletes already – it's funny because I have like basically two kinds of athletes right now. I have athletes that are like antsy chomping at the bit to like – taper and get ready to race like their big race of the year and then i've got athletes who are the opposite who are chomping at the bit 
ready to like get recovery done so they can start looking at what they want to do for like the next year. So it's like two polar opposites. Uh, do you find yourself in any one of those buckets or are you just kind of like, hey, I'm taking it easy, I'm enjoying myself, and uh, I'll kind of see what the next week brings? Um, I'm guarded chomping at the bit. Guarded. Guarded chomping at the bit. What does that mean? Well, it means I'm, I'm, I'm positive, but I'm not oh, okay. overzealous about going crazy uh-huh. right now. I'm excited about our last podcast, honestly. Really? Uh, yeah, the, the discussion we had there at the end about um, thinking about my bike as more of a weakness than a strength, that that's kind of got me a little excited, actually. Yeah, I mean, I did, well, come on now. I didn't call it your weakness. <laughs> you said I'm a weak cyclist. <laughs> I didn't say you were a weak cyclist. <laughs> you're a weakless. You're a, definitely a weaklist. Uh, uh, no, I just said that, you know, you, we've always, if you haven't, if you haven't listened to it, I would definitely go back. I think it was, we got a lot of great feedback from that podcast in the last few. So, uh, go back and check those out along with the other 302 that we have. But no, I, ever since I've been working with you, which is like going on seven years now, you've always kind of put cycling in like your forefront. It's kind of like, a, you know, I got this. You know, um, if all else fails, I got this. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I kind of challenged you at the end of the, the episode on last Thursday was to kind of rethink how that may have changed. And it's been funny because as I brought that up to you, I've had like other athletes email me and be like, I think I'm, I think I might be in the same boat. I think I've kind of overestimated um, what I'm good at and what I'm, you know, maybe what I'm not, like where I might have natural ability in other areas and I'm not really uh, maximizing to the potential because I'm fought, kind of resting on my my preconceived athletic laurels of what I really believe I'm good at and not looking at where the numbers truly lie. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting to think about it that way. And again, it's sort of this, uh, I think about three years ago, <clears throat> I got into this, oh, I got to be a big swimmer in a big cyclist mode and because it's always that thing where if you're not going to be feeling good off the bike, what's the difference? If you're, what kind of mm-hmm. runner you are? And I got sort of mentally in that place, but I still never push the bike, I don't think, as much. And the big challenge is I was actually at the bike shop the other day. I was changing out that uh, disc wheel and the gear mm-hmm. and the cassettes and I was I was back in this like mode of uh, talking to those guys a little bit about buying a road bike. And I, mm. I, I really think that might be something that would be smart because I, I just think I would like riding a road bike more. Yeah. You know. Uh, the do you tr- think? Do you think it would? Okay. What do you mean by that? Because I think a lot of people have that like thought and feeling um, this time of year because they're looking at maybe, um, you know maybe getting a mountain bike or maybe getting out and doing different things to work on their bike handling or just to kind of change up. Like if you watch or if you follow any like professional athletes, like once, once Kona is done for the, the ones who focus on that, they spend a lot of their fall and winter on, you know, cyclocross or gravel rides or mountain bike just to really change up. Cause you're still getting the, you know, the, they're building the aerobic base, but they're, they're working on different things. And I think, uh, allowing opportunities for things like that when obviously you can't, we can't all have, the ability to um you know have multiple bikes i think getting out on a road bike or getting a mountain bike those things are always good anything anytime you can change things up i think it's always good mm-hmm. uh especially if it's going to get you out the door more to do more things and, and really just kind of get back to not ta- no, i don't want to say not taking things so seriously but understanding i think that there are so many ways to improve and while we love to have our tri bikes and we love to have them on the train and we basically never want to take them off and people don't even ride outside anymore. We want to take things other, you know, uh, you know, we want to make sure everything's perfect in our little pain cave. There's just so much, especially if we ever get these like fall cooler temps, getting outside and just riding for the sake of riding is it's just so good for you and you can accumulate so many extra hours and really become just a better all around cyclist by accumulating more time in the saddle, which I think is something that a lot of athletes uh, tend to overlook and not take, you know, because everybody's all about intensity or hopping on swift and just pounding out in a group race. It's just like there's accumulating time. It's it's kind of funny you mentioned that because I wanted to kind of go this direction today, but I think I think it'd be a great thing for you. Yeah, that's it. I think I, I was actually 
thinking that I might put my TT bike on the trainer and then get a road bike from touring. <laughs> You're gonna get a touring bike. You're gonna get like a basket on the front. <laughs> I don't with, uh... know. <laughs> but isn't that kind of what they call like regular road bikes? Is more of a touring bike, uh, Tour de France type of thing. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's probably right. A touring. So bike, yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's just to kind of uh, maybe put some love back in the game for me. Uh, and to me, because I've always just, I really do, and I think I just, I don't know, the layout of a road bike just me, it feels a little more comfortable, maybe or something, or. Uh, that could be that could be wrong maybe i'm just looking for an excuse to get a new bike uh but um then you get into like should i just get a tri bike well maybe i'll just sell my tri bike and get a new one if i want it later but i just want to ride more and i that's a long way to get to that but uh why do you want do you want to ride more or do you think you need to ride more yeah <laughs> <laughs> well i mean it's it, you know it's like you know what comes first chicken or the egg but well, what that's is it mm-hmm. yeah this is that time of year where I I need to ride more, I think. And even if it's not a ton, if I can, because this is a perfect example of me after my race. <laughs> I, if anything, like last year, I really kind of stayed with the running and swimming, and mm-hmm. uh, I just sort of shelved the old bike from you know post race Louisville through the beginning right. of the year, and and I'm like, well, I just pick that back up, you know, and then I never. But if I, I now I'm thinking, well, man, if I can keep the cycling base up and then get into the new year and then hit some longer rides and blah blah blah, you know, it's that same old story of like you're saying, chicken and the egg is is like the story of my life. Right. It's. Well, I mean, I don't know. The chicken and the egg is like the story of your life. That sounds like a, <laughs> that sounds like a solid like kids book though. <laughs> it's like maybe, maybe you could do one of those for Hayden, written by Uncle Mike Trolley. <laughs> uh, uh, I lost you. Can you hear me now? There, I got you. Oh, that's a, oh, that was odd. I think I must have hit the the mute button. Um, oh, you've got a mute button. Well, I didn't. Sometimes I forget that I have one. It's like on my. Uh, it's on my actual headset. Oh. Uh, like the, you know, like the little the gray button. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, chicken but no, egg. yeah, I'm just gonna put that away and put tape over it. Um, but no, what I was trying to say and like alluding to kind of the conversation I wanted to have today was, I think like as a as a coach right now, again, like I said, a lot of athletes are like getting ready for big races of the year, and then a lot of athletes are finishing uh, are having they're they're done. Their season is basically over, so they're they're starting to plan on how I want to execute. Uh, the next year, you know, what I want to accomplish. And I think, I think one of the hardest things for athletes, and again, this is also one of the hardest parts of being a coach is that if you know, you have an athlete who wants to like, let's say like you're planning on doing Ironman Wisconsin next year. Mm -hmm. And this is just totally hypothetical is that now is like that time where you want to basically plan backwards, you know, and I want to peak on this day. And I think one of the more difficult aspects, again, as, a, as both a coach and as an athlete or the self-coached athlete that will want to follow a training plan is having that A race is, is obviously the main goal. But then putting races before that offer opportunities to express fitness. But what they also offer are potential ways to get distracted or go down a path you don't want to go down quite yet to be fully prepared on race day because if you like if you're looking at the whole like the 50 some odd weeks that you would want to prepare for for a big race of that magnitude and of that distance and length is obviously you work your way backwards so for a guy like you you've you've obviously you're going to recover for a couple weeks and then if you really want to plan out your time then you would really want to spend the next you know whatever 8 12 maybe even 16 weeks just creating because you already have a great base is just like keeping things very easy and relaxed basically spending a lot of your time in in just zone one and zone two and so right now doing something like picking up uh trail running or mountain biking or picking up a road bike like all those are good things that can help you achieve that goal but then as you start to sprinkle in other races down the line where we fall in terms of do I want to peak early or do I want to risk 
not being ready to peak at the, on the main day. Like, so let's say you want, you're also going to do Chattanooga 70.3 next year. You've done that. What? Like the last, what, four years, I think mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. And so let's say you're, let's say you've got this, this was constant build like 50 weeks and you got all, all mapped out. I'm going to go through a base phase where I'm going to work on strength and work on big gear work, uh, muscular endurance, and just totally uh, aerobic capacity. And then after that, I want to move towards, uh, you know, bumping up my functional threshold power or my, my, uh, my maximal power. And when you get to that phase, now you're starting to creep closer and closer to where you would find yourself implementing a race specific focus for Chattanooga 70.3. Okay. And the build for that might not overlap perfectly into what you're wanting to accomplish to be ready for in Wisconsin. And so what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that when you're looking at planning the rest of your off season or the rest of your year, you obviously will have an A race and you obviously work your way backwards to have races in the middle. But the, the tough question for a lot of athletes is, is how much do I want to manipulate and change things so that I can feel like I'm gaining fitness or can, that I can feel like I'm ready to have my quote unquote best race for these 70.3s while not sacrificing the integrity of the total plan. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause see, cause like as a coach, it's difficult because obviously your athletes want to see improvement <laughs> and that's like, that's all they want to do. They want to see improvement. And then once they have improved, they want to improve more. And I had like an, an athlete specifically for Wisconsin who raced a, a couple 70.3s and I was like, and I had to kind of tell him, even though his races went well, I kind of tell him, I was like, we're not a, we're not unloading fully before these races we're i'm not tapering you full we're not peaking yet this isn't this isn't time so i think it's important to communicate that with athletes but it also requires a great deal of trust to remember and also a not just trust but a a, a huge amount of restraint to have to have that big picture in your mind and not just always have this new end date where you're changing things up and you're trying to change stimulus up every six to eight to 12 weeks, things will fit in. Right. But like for you now is the great, now is a great time to start building this, this huge base that you want to, um, that you want to be able to apply for when you get into a race specific phase next season. So I think that, um, that's, that's where I wanted to go with the topic today, but I think where you're just generally headed is a great idea mm -hmm. because riding more, because again, we we use this analogy all the time is that you you got to build your chassis, you know. And like, and if I talk to a new athlete on the phone, I say, listen, we want to build your chassis so big that we can't that there is basically almost no risk on creating an engine that's too big for the chassis. Whereas most athletes spend so much time trying to build an engine, and they do they do FTP work and threshold work 24/7 all the time and track intervals and mile repeats all the time. But then they start to falter the latter part of half marathons or marathons or 70.3s and fulls because their body is like, hey, yeah, I get that I'm this fast, but I can't really go that far mm -hmm. because they because you cheat yourself in spending the time that you need, like you're kind of expressing just I think through just listening to your body and what you kind of mentally and emotionally want to want to do right now is just building that durability and strength. So that later on in the year, you can express fully all of your fitness and all the gains you've made and, and be able to sustain that for the duration of whatever race it is that you choose. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that was a little bit long winded. Well, no, it's, it's, it's <laughs> well taken. And I also think that I like this idea because I did do Chattanooga in May and there's part of me that kind of thinks I wish I would have done one other race. Oh, um, interesting. Because I, I felt like I was a little rusty. Uh, or not rusty, but like, you know, I just didn't have that sort of race explosion kind of. Uh, mm. I, I don't know how to flat? explain Yeah, a little bit flat maybe. Okay, so flat. Do you think you, and we talked about this sometimes, like do you feel like you lost like a little too much tension in the legs? Uh, that's possible. Well, you, weren't, you weren't as crisp or just let's just stick with stale? I was stale. I was Let's just stick with stale or flat. Yeah, either one. I mean, they're both, they're um, both much the same. Yeah, it's. A, I mean, that's the the thing, right? Is like I think that uh, while I my focus was like I didn't want to get into too many other races. I wanted to focus on the plan, and I think I just, especially for the bike, 
I think I, I kind of shortchanged it. And in other words, I didn't give it my all and, um, you know, give it those race testy type rides enough. Mm. And to me, that was more it than anything. Um, and possibly the swim, you know, I could have probably maybe used another competitive swim because even Chattanooga swim was a shortened downstream 15 minute swim. Right. So it wasn't even a, a real. So maybe maybe there's opportunity to do some swim races or something, you know, like mile and a half race, whatever they are throughout training, just to kind of get that that competitive race juices going. That's what I was thinking so a little bit. Because your your race before that was what Chattanooga. Mm-hmm. So you're looking at June, July, August, four months. Right. Almost almost like yeah, probably four months for sure if not maybe a little more than just like four months days wise because of the, how the months are laid out but that's a long time i know i know um and you usually i think if like we look back i think one of your better races you did what lake logan which is probably maybe too close um it's like but five I think, weeks out or right something. it's like five weeks out so it's, it's not terrible but it's definitely not it's like right in that last window of when you want to be like in doing your most volume um but that was what was that before wisconsin the year that we, you and i did it yep did, or was that before yeah okay so and you did well that year yeah um uh, 20 minutes faster than this year right so i mean and obviously that's not you know that's not like hey we that, again like when you go back and review things like you have to be really really objective and kind of take things with a grain of salt by saying okay yeah, that worked that year, but does that mean I need to go look this year and say, all right, I'm doing Ironman Wisconsin. Let me find a 70.3 five weeks before him because that's worked perfectly for me. You're right. No, yeah, that's right. Little... No, it's like we can't we can't jump to that. Even though a lot of people like to like make those the, those huge jumps and conclusions because it it requires like little to no thought process. We're you just kind of that... like taking a dart and throwing it on a dartboard and think, oh, yep, yeah, that's stuck. That's definitely got to be what it is. Like I, that's what I got to do. I got to have at least one more ride. But you just we you don't know, and that's why you have to look at the whole to- the whole season, in in its totality versus just these specific windows leading up to races. Mm. You know what that was though? It was a quick. Uh, what did you call that before? Like quick build or a short build? Yeah, it was a very short build. For yeah, you. and and as that sort of always resonates with me too. Like if I keep my you know base if i'm just kind of working on my chassis and chassis mm-hmm. and then get closer to the race and then build it up especially as i get older you know it's like right uh that makes a lot of sense to me and that felt a little bit at the time because it was you know i think what my third or no, it was my fourth i guess but it, uh, i still was like man this does feel a little bit rushed or whatever but um i came what i what i did after that half though five weeks out I went right back into it and I actually right, yeah. felt like man that was you really good you recovered well too I, I remember I recovered well yep. and I started I think that race was on a Saturday Saturday and yep. I was back at it hard Monday um, or not hard but like in full swing and I felt I didn't miss a beat you know and and that was huge because usually after a, even a half I'll have to take mm-hmm. you know, several days but I just was mentally I think that's a big part of it is that I was mentally uh, I was like, you know, dude, you don't have time to be screwing around here. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think, I think kind of like without planning it, I think this is like a good, like live version of like how to like retroactively go back and look at what worked and what didn't work for you as an athlete, like as the listener, because as a coach, like I'm, I'm hearing Mike saying this and we look back and, and I'm not even looking at his training, but I can, I know this just from knowing him like you do, but is that, you know, you've always kind of, You've always done well, and you say this is like, you know, wait, not wait, I don't want to say like wait until the last minute, but like the the two words like pressure and procrastination are all, are like pretty much interchangeable. Mm-hmm. Like you, you like a little bit of pressure, but you, you know, and that kind of, that can lead to like procrastination. And this year was like the, this year was one of the more consistent earlier parts of the year than I think you've ever had. Mm-hmm. Um, and going back to what, I, I was talking about in the podcast from last week was that I've seen so many athletes who just do awesome on like because I, I do I think athletes get stale after about a five or six week Ironman build like they they lose their ability to get faster and they're just really accumulating fatigue to get more tired and I think 
what may have happened with you this year and this is just part of being a coach and like looking back and acknowledging that because listen like let's just be honest with you coaches don't do coaches don't do all the things right like we make mistakes we see areas of improvement like there's there's two specific instances where athletes just sent me kind of like a race recaps of their season and wanted me to give like feedback and i gave them some honest feedback about where they've done well and where i think we could improve but some of the other parts I put on there was like, I think I need to do a better job of preparing you in these manners, have, you know, seeing, seeing what we're seeing now. And that's just not because of a race. Like everyone wants to look at, all right, can you look at my race and tell me where things went right or wrong? Like, I mean, I can tell you what went right or went wrong, but I, but if you really want to understand why and how, then we, I got to look back at the last like 16 weeks. <laughs> like the race day is just the expression of, and you know the the metal that you see that is that is drawn and created and cultivated the last four months or five or six weeks like it's just it's an expression it's not how you got there you know it's like it's the abstract summary of the you know 48 page you know research paper you just put in like that's what it is it's just a summary it's not how you got there and so for you while and you and you kind of mentioned this, I think too, is that like you thought you didn't necessarily peak early, and I think you even alluded to like you said false confidence. I don't know if that, I don't know if that because I didn't feel like an overconfident vibe from you, but I think you went through such a different training phase and getting focused so early that it maybe wasn't false confidence; it was more. I've, I've done so much more than what I did previously that it has to add up to a better race. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's, I don't think that's wrong because that's also, you know, because that's could also be right in, in certain areas, but that's, it's a great, it's a great discussion and a great topic just in general, because a more isn't always better. And it's all, it's, and it's definitely, it's never about what's more or the volume or the intensity. It's where you put it and how you do it that matters most and for a guy like you and i think if people do this with like their plan or they break out a spreadsheet or they're trying to plan out their year uh, you you might see and, and again this is how when i say i ask a lot of not a lot i ask a little bit of my every day each week every week instead of like these huge weeks it's because if i can get you to do eight to eleven hours every week basically you know not year round but basically year round and you're going to do some 70.3s where you're going to do you know uh some 12 to 14 maybe 15 hour weeks if you do like one or two of those then all you need is a five or seven week ironman build Mm -hmm. because you've built that entire you didn't have like a huge 12 week jump you know where your body gets stale and super fatigued because again like when you look at long course racing and training like you're accumulating so much fatigue to a certain point you can no longer give your body's just like i'm at my max like and i know you want me to get faster but i can't produce anything or i can't complete these workouts like you want me to in order to get faster because i'm just so tired and so i think you we in terms of your plan the volume distribution may have been shifted the volume might have been perfect it just might have been the timing of the volume, like maybe pushing the volume back. Because, like, I think, again, when you look at intensity distribution and creating stress, let's say that, you know, I think, and again, this is where athletes tend to sometimes, uh, I think, not, I don't want to say get it wrong, but might misunderstand periodization is that, you know, we, I talk about, everybody wants to talk about, like, not everybody, but training stress score in terms of, like, accumulating stress. And, you know, like we've talked about, I think, last week, even before, it was like, you can create 100 points off of a very short, hard interval ride, or you can get 100 points, too, by going, like, two hours longer, but keeping it all easier. Mm-hmm. And what you want to do is your your biggest hours for some athletes need to be before they even get to, like, race-specific phase, because you want to build up and build up and build up. And then you want to start adding an intensity. And I think yours may have been reversed. Whereas I think you may have done better doing the most amount of your, and obviously we always can't control this and we don't know. And I think also life dictates when these phases happen because it's about availability, but maybe you're better suited having like a May, June, obviously again, going back to like a September date is like you may be better suited going off like an april may june 
larger volume, really building that base, really building a lot of strength, and then basically reducing hours, but upping the intensity. And again, that's what that's what getting faster is about. It's like it's not always about creating more volume. It's about being able to accumulate more miles or more intensity or more or create more you know, longer distances within a shorter period of time. You know, like if I if you reach critical mass of weekly run volume at five hours, you don't have to keep going at five hours. The name of the game now is to create more mileage because you keep getting faster within those five hours. So five hours, one week might accumulate you 30 miles. But then eight to 12 weeks from now, we know you can only handle five hours on the body. Well, then we eventually want to get to where you're accumulating 40 miles. You know, and so I think it's, it's again, you can't always go back and look at at one race, but if we can take years of information and what we think might have gone wrong, right, and look back at what worked and what didn't, then, again, it's about taking, you know, it's like, for those of you who, like, get married, it's like, you know, the person you meet, you can, you got there because you, you made so many mistakes and found so many things you liked or didn't like about all these other people. And then you're like, okay, this, this can work. You know, I, this is who I'm going to marry. And so looking at like how you change and, and undulate your training and the intensity, it's about collecting everything. It's not about making rash decisions. And I think triathletes are, are, are kings at making rash decisions and impulse buys or purchases or making assumptions based on one race when you really need to look at the total picture and if you have so much information like you have in training peaks and just knowledge between coach athlete you know relationship and then obviously our friendship is like then you can really look back and like all right now we can actually like now we have all the info you know like you don't want to you don't want to do a scientific you know, paper on a, you know, on a survey of one, you know, we interviewed one person and found that 100% of all athletes responded like, no, that's how you do, you, you do like 15, 20, 25, and you do, you know, studies at varying lengths and population. So now that you have years and years and years and cycles and races, now you can think, all right, this is, this is what I need. This is what I think the next journey needs to look like. And again, that's why triathlon is so much fun and I think in good and bad ways uh, because people want to tinker, but they tinker for the sake of tinkering, not strategically looking for and trying to answer the questions that will lead them to achieving the results they wanted to this year, but didn't so they can next year. Mm -hmm. I've only had one cup of coffee, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. I'm on like a massive, like you're rolling uh, a massive, like uh, brain dump right now. That's fine, man. Uh, The other, you know, I'm actually in the process of writing sort of my race recap. And um, basically I think the title of it's going to be is I took a risk. And a lot of that comes back to, I I took a risk. I mean, it's obvious to me that I didn't have enough cycling volume, first of all. Mm-hmm. But when I come out of the water, see, like I told you, you know, when I come out of the water and I think I, you know, I'm not racing this year just to go under 12 hours. I'm kind of trying to go for it a little top 10, top five, you know, hopefully that's sort of where my goal lies. And when I get out of the water and I know that I'm in deep hole there, I didn't know, but you know what I mean? I, I, I knew I was in uh, at 124 in the swim most likely I'm playing catch up. Yeah. And especially because no one's shouting, you're right there. <laughs> That's what I keep yeah. waiting for you guys all you day. Like, yeah. It's like, you know, you're there. You're, you know, I, I didn't hear one time. You're only an hour 20 back on the marathon. <laughs> um, but so in my mind, I'm like, all right, I got to make up a little time on the bike. And I am immediately, you know, it's just a risk. And you talk about taking risks. Sometimes you got to take them. And, I I was like, well, you know, I know my run's in pretty good shape. Maybe I could just pull this off. And then uh, my risk on the bike turned into a letdown because I couldn't even go out and get, you know, something faster than I've done in the past. And at some point that was like, oh, shit, now I'm really under the the gun here. So, but I took the chance. Um, I didn't really push, like, I didn't, I wouldn't say I went, you know, what do you say? If, you, if you're saying 70% effort on Ironman, I probably was in the 75, in my mind, 75% range or something like mm-hmm. that. 
Yeah. And that I I wasn't going like half Iron Man effort or anything crazy like that. I was just going after it when I could and trying to do the best I could to, you know, take advantage of sections of that course. And um, so, you know, that pretty much fried me. I, if I hold back a little bit, maybe my run is 10, 15 minutes faster, possibly. But, you know, I knew that wasn't what I needed. You know, that wasn't mm-hmm. going to put me anywhere near whatever. And and I'm not like regretting that. You know what I mean? That's the thing. It's like, right. it's like a learning you know, you learn from mistakes, right? So I got to go out and make some mistakes today to learn. And it wasn't like, you know, I wasn't just going out there just to do a, you know, little 12 hour thing and get a medal. I I wanted to see if this running had paid off. And, and again, it just all circles back to my bike wasn't prepared for that course again. Again, (laughs) I mean, I think you're being, now you're being kind of being a little too hard on yourself. Oh, I like it though. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so I mean yeah it's I think when you when you kind of have to have and again like what you're doing is is rarely I think the conversation a lot of athletes have with themselves a lot of athletes don't like to look in the mirror and think where did I go wrong what did I not do it's always either you know a coach didn't have them ready or the course was too hard or the conditions just weren't right or this and this like it's like it's really really hard in general and in life to objectively look in the mirror and the first the first person the first direction you look to and ask for what can be done better is in your own eyes mm. Yeah. And not into, I got to have a new bike or I didn't have my race wheels or I, I you know, I did change up shoes a, a week or two before. Like, you know, there's always, because again, those are the more, those are the more comfortable areas to look because they have nothing to do with us and our, and our ability to be consistent or our ability to train, right? Our ability to stay healthy, our ability to, to work hard enough or because kind of on the flip side of that is like, oh, I really want to do this or I really want to do X, Y, and Z next year. But then if I had to give you like the reciprocated requirements for achieving those, you're like, eh, nah, nah, that's not really what I'm thinking. I'm thinking about I can I can probably do this and still achieve. And you're like, no, that's not really how it works, but um, good luck to you. But still, you'll find athletes gravitating more towards enjoying the fact that they can want and wish and hope and exclaim and post on social media what they're going to do next year. But when the reality comes back to the requirement that you have to take on to achieve it, not many people want to do that because it it's not it's not fancy it's not fun it's not um it's not enjoyable sometimes it can be monotonous but the hardest thing to do is 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 looking look in the mirror you know and think what can i do that's better what how can i execute better what do i need to change and instead of like what do i need to buy um and so I think it's a great conversation that athletes sh- should have, and they should always say, like, just as a coach, like, you can't blame your athletes. You can't say, oh, uh, you know, you didn't do this and you didn't do that. It has to be either we, we need to do this better, or we need to find a way, or we did we did this right, so now we need to do this. And Or if, you're, if you feel like you didn't, you could have done better in a specific area – because again, coaching isn't 100% accurate 24/7. Like you can, you can have really good results, but good results are one, but taking the leap from good to great is a whole nother one. And you often can't jump from good to great without really acknowledging and looking back on what went good, and then how we can move the needle even more to get to great. And that takes again, like ownership. I, I don't think we did this right. I think we need to change things up. I don't. I think I need to prepare you better on this time of year, you know, in order to be able to do this later, you know? And so it's, it's, it's a conversation that always needs to be had. And, but again, it's not, the conversation is the easy part. Signing up for the race is the easy part. Exclaiming or to, you know, road to Kona hashtag is the easy part. Getting there (laughs) is like so much harder. It's not even in the same stratosphere. Like the things you have to do and the focus you have to have. And I think that, it's like, you know, do you, are you willing to do those things and, and lining up? What do you want to sacrifice? What do you don't like? Mm-hmm. What are you, you know, it's, it's, so I, I do, I think it's tough, but I think it's, I think no matter what level you end up getting to better is always the answer and better is what you should be going after. You shouldn't just be settled for this. Now, what 
you know, quote unquote, better it gets you to, or how much faster it gets you, or what you know, what place on the podium it gets you, or do you get lucky enough to get a slot to, to Kona? Like, you know, those are like, those are a lot of things. Like, really, just out of your control. Yeah. You know, it's like who shows up I on race that, day, man. who does? It's just like, hey, yeah, it's just out of your control. You can do the best you can, and you can look at one age group and be like, listen, if I was like actually younger, I would have like podiumed and qualified. You know, <laughs> or you know, or the old, you know, so. Again, like you just have to always have this in like insatiable appetite for. I just want to figure out how good I can be. I don't know what that ceiling is. I don't know what those results might bring. I don't know if the you know expectations that I have based on results or qualifying or podiums or whatever might ever be met. But I just do just know that I just want to keep getting better because it's within that pursuit of trying to get better and trying to figure things out that you will always find your a much better version of yourself than had you not you know it's like people always say, you know, I think whatever stat it is that the human like humans only use like an incredibly and almost in like embarrassingly small percentage of their actual like brain you know like what it's capable of it's like a very small number and athletes again I think are very much the same like very 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 few athletes on this planet very few are able to absolutely get every ounce of ability in their body because it takes such a long time and it takes consistent hard work and every time you change something or doubt something or deviate you either take steps backwards or you get farther away and I was watching the slideshow from Altus yesterday and they had a slide that said the to two things it said the likelihood of achieving a performance goal is increased seven times in those that complete 80% or more of their training. For every modified training week, there is a 25% reduction in the likelihood of success. So if you think about right. trying to reach your, yeah, I mean, it's, it, those are like in, insane stats. And we, we've said this before on a, one of our earliest podcasts was that like, you know, training availability and giving yourself the ability to train, that's like 90% of the battle. And, and being is just because you're able to be consistent and keep going things you know, over, and keep continuing to do things over and over and over again. So when you think about like those statistics and those percentages and what's required to not fall into those categories or to be a person who falls in the 80% plus category, like it's, con it's constant. You know, it's just really constant work that in constant figuring things out and not getting lazy. And so if that's what you want to do and that's what you want to achieve and that's what you you want to complete or push the needle on how well you can perform. You got to be willing to do that. And sometimes it means staying the course and not changing and knowing what you're doing is working and having the patience to stick with it and not change it, but, you know, uh, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it or recognize that something might be broken and it's time to fix it. Mm -hmm. And th again, those, those are all about timing and, um, what you do afterwards that dictate how well or how not well it's going to work out for you. I've always been in the Kona trap, as you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't look at that as a negative by any means. I just think that, like, after reflecting on this race, I, I actually had to be honest with myself looking in the mirror and say, you know what, I don't know if I, and this, again, I'm not, like, ripping on myself, but I just don't know if I have the mental fortitude to go that route. Mm -hmm. And it comes back to what you just said about those stats, because 25% reduction with the modifications and all that business that's like a huge problem with me and I I have when I think about you as my coach and we talk every week and and what I love about you as a coach mostly is that we can banter back and forth and kind of look for solutions as in you know I know I didn't ride enough okay maybe you need a road bike maybe you should try mountain biking more maybe let's find that because to me it's about all right, we know, and a lot of us know that we have the quote-unquote talent or ability to get there. It's just a matter of finding the love to that level, the commitment to that level to, you know, maybe spark something inside you that, that just creates that, like, yeah, consistency and that we talk about this all the time is like, 
ending a workout and really looking forward to the next one versus, oh, I'm glad that's over. I just do not want to go tomorrow already. You know, mm-hmm. so yeah. those are the little things. And I, I know that like, you know, blaming, uh, blaming a coach for something is just like no, never anything that really crosses my mind. Uh, I, I think that they're, I think the biggest asset that you bring as a coach is that you're willing to work with people and you're not like one dimensional and you're not going to drive somebody to do what they want or you're not going to blame them. You know, that's like the huge part of this thing because it really does come to looking at yourself. And I just recognize, I think that at least for now, maybe it'll change, but to get to that level that I, I keep dreaming of is, is, is on me. And I got to really, you know, either figure out how to love it more, or, you know, find the passion for longer rides and, you know, time in the saddle and things like that. Or, you know, the odds of it happening are pretty slim, you know. So, and that's okay. That's okay. I mean, because along the way, I have clearly, um, it, if nothing else, I just did an Ironman and I was limping half or maybe for one day and then I was fine on Tuesday. That's a huge win. Yeah, for sure. Um, I've felt pretty good since that day. Uh, I feel like I don't dislike the sport in any regard. I'm, I'm still it's a positive. excited about going forward and getting better. Um, now, how much better is the question? But I like the idea of just keeping getting better. And I'm well, a little more comfortable with that. And I think I think that's something that, you know, again, like everyone gets like swept up in Kona and that, but I mean, listen, man, like that's not the epitome of what makes an athlete successful. No. And frankly, I don't even know if I want to go to Kona anymore. Right. <laughs> I was thinking about that this year. I was like, well, you know, it's so like, I I've, I've thought about that too. And like, I'm still trying to get better, but as I've like, as I've started to coach more full time and like, I look at where I am in my personal life and I had a, you know, I had an athlete, that I coached we were kind of going back and forth on on this last year and he reminded me of something and he was like you know man he's like or he, we were talking I was talking about struggling with making my own making time for myself and you know and putting my training first and you know because I, I I absolutely love my job and I honestly like I love coaching other athletes right now more than I do myself and like, the, cause what I get out of it, it's just like, it's, you know, cause I think most people would say like when you can do things for other people, it's infinitely more gratifying than just doing something for yourself. Uh, now again, like should I take time for myself? Absolutely. But he said, you know, on your tombstone, there's a date you, the date you were born, a dash and the date you die. And the only thing that matters and what people remember is that what happens in that dash and it just made me thinking more like, yeah, like I, you know, why, yeah, is it a struggle to like make time for myself and do I probably need to like shift my pre, not goals, but my previous expectations of what those goals may reach in like, you know, qualifying for certain events or doing certain things like, yeah, maybe, but it still means that I love what I'm doing. And again, like it's, I'm not getting burnt out by any stretch, um, but I had an athlete and this is kind of like going to what you said who was like uh was not really well yeah she was apologizing because she always apologizes for some reason but she's like you know i just i i want to take my family time this weekend and while i really want to achieve the goals that i have for iron man which are high goals she was like i really needed this family time and so i just sent her a text and i said reaching our goals will mean nothing if we feel guilty about how we went to achieve them and I think that that's something that we could all remind ourselves of this time of year is like, you know, what are we willing to sacrifice? <laughs> you know, like what are we willing to sacrifice time wise or hours wise or not spending time with our family or our friends or doing the things that we love so I can squeeze in three to four more hours a week to be lonelier and train 25 hours to maybe or maybe not do one thing and then look back and think I didn't like, man, I missed out on so much. You know, and so I think that it's, I think it's a great conversation to have. You can still get better and push yourself and learn things about it and still be insanely successful. Because, like, I'll be honest, like, <laughs> there are 40 slots for mo- for Kona at most races, and I guarantee you there are so many more people than just 40 successful athletes at every race. 
and that's not the barrier and that's not the mark to which you measure yourself from and it's about are you loving the sport are you happy with how you're doing it are you do you have a good family life work balance are you are you showing yourself grace are you being kind to yourself are you not beating yourself up 24 7 and that's and again too like i know we have quite a few coaches that listen to this podcast and i coach a lot of coaches I'm like, if you're not expressing that to your athletes that this is there is more to being successful and there's more to performance than qualifying for Kona or calling for for 70.3 worlds, then you're missing the boat. Because there are so many opportunities that we have within this sport to be successful and how those things can can look back and can produce other positive attributes in our life, whether it's business, business wise, or relationships or with our friends. It's like connecting with people. Like my total, my, my favorite picture. And hopefully you can use this for the, the podcast picture. Today. My favorite picture from this whole weekend was that picture in, in the, the food tent afterwards of you and Strasser and Phil and Blake um, all sitting around and kind of, I think somebody said like the, the C26 debrief. Yeah. Um, but it was, a you know, it's not Blake cause he's not an older guy, but it was all three of you guys, all three in the same age group, all three with really, really high, you know, aspirations of what they want to accomplish and have already been really, really successful in my opinion. And, you know, I thought it was even really, it was super interesting cause you, you guys and like, I don't think Mark Moody was pictured, but he was pretty, I think he was around there. It was that you guys, you guys came in 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th, all yeah, in a row, respectively. In, in in a respectively in a absolutely uh, in an absolutely loaded age group, and for for this for this age group and at this race, and um, I think it just it summed up really really well having that perspective and while you're competing against other people but with other people you know you also have that that camaraderie and that friendship and that bond that is something that you you couldn't have if you were so singularly focused and you ended a race only thinking of yourself and what you didn't accomplish or what you weren't able to do and your failures and failures instead of how you're able to succeed what went well the journey to get there and who you did it with and I think those are things that you just that you just can't come by all the time. And so if you're sacrificing those for just the chance, and again, like there's nothing wrong with wanting to qualify for those. I have plenty of athletes who whose dream or whose whose goal is to qualify for Kona, and a lot of them that can. But it's still about like what are you willing to sacrifice you know, along the way? And I think that's a that's always a good question to ask yourself. Yeah, I'm asking it. Yeah, I'm kind of on a roll today. Yeah, man, it's uh, that was uh, maybe one of my favorite moments of race day. That picture, when you know. Oh, it's easily my favorite pic. My favorite picture. It was like that's like so cool to like see. Um, yeah, the picture outside, is great, but just that moment of the, yeah. the the idea that you know, and if one of us had qualified for Kona, we probably wouldn't have been sitting there. You know. <laughs> and no, just... that's not true. You guys would have been like. <laughs> Super pumped for the other one. I know, but like you if, know, if one of you guys had back showering, you wouldn't have been there. They'd be back showering, hanging out, and not come back to the finish line. Excuse me, who are you guys again? Yeah, <laughs> no, but we just—it was great. I mean, we finished, and uh, just to be able to sort of share that moment of man, we just went through that. You know, I, w- I woke up that morning and uh, looked out. I could see the lake, and and it's like that weird feeling of. I wonder if my body. Well, I'm sure my body knows what it's about to go through, you know, and, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's a massive, massive undertaking and you do it and you push through it and, and everybody talks about how fast it goes by and it does. And, and then just to like plop down with, with your buddies that you've been talking about this race for so long and kind of hash it out and just look in each other's face and see the war scars, you know, it's like, what a moment that is. And that's the stuff that it really does. The memory bank is filled with that and not what you did on the course or your times mm-hmm. and things like that. So you're right, man. What are you willing to sacrifice? Um, it's, it's a tough one, man. It's, and it, but you know, and I think there's a happy medium and you can do both, but I think it's that, I think it's that fine line. And I think that's that end of the spectrum where people call triathlon a, a selfish sport. 
you know, and I think I think that's ultimately like the, ultimately like the the easiest way to ask yourself in a, in a way because again like there's also times where you should be very selfish with yourself and mm, take yeah. time for yourself. Like don't get me wrong, like I, I'm I'm all about you know boundaries and like doing things for yourself and making sure you take care of you. Um, I probably don't always do that, but I I'm all for it. Um, but, but it's like you know, am I going to get more out of life by being selfish or unselfish? And that, you know, that might be an answer a lot of your questions. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, yeah, I think it's like when you look back at, you know, I think the first thing you do is you look back on your year and what went right and what went wrong and where I can improve and how I can do better and, and maybe things to tweak or maybe distances to choose or different races to pick and, and then and then pick what do you want to achieve or what do you want to go for or what's your main goal for the year. And then again, before you even go the next step further, it's, all right, let's have a real conversation about what it might take to get me there. And am I willing to try to make that leap? Or if I'm not, then I need to recognize that and accept it, understand that it's okay, and then say, I love the fact that right now I'm still getting better, I'm still achieving things, but I also am still able to have both. I still have a great family life work balance. I still have friends. I still have good perspective. I'm still kind to myself and I'm still having fun. And that's how you have to go through things. And once you can answer all those, then it's time to pick something, you know, with yourself, with your family, spouse, kids, you know, your coach, whatever. That's when it's time to pick. And you, but you need to check all those boxes first and, and understand and be realistic. And, and again, and just look in the mirror and have that conversation that most people, you know, most people don't like to have or don't want to have. But yeah. hopefully we had it today on the Crushing Iron Podcast, episode right. 303. <laughs> 303. <laughs> 303, start date. Um, well, we definitely did. And uh, I think it's good to, I like to be open, you know, and I think that's what we do. And this, you know, can open the door for everyone else maybe to have that conversation or like I I don't I have no shame or anything like that about my race it's just a matter of looking at what it was what is and Mm -hmm. and just checking it out and deciding what because I go you know I think we need to wrap this up but I just I went through this training block where I did make decisions as to what I was going to do and I was maybe protective and selfish of certain days and workouts and I think that's great it's just a matter of what do you what are you deciding against is it is it mm. yeah giving up on the Saturday morning tailgate with your buddies or is it you know giving up on something that might be really valuable to your family um, yeah you know, what choice is that you know and I think it's good to make the choice against the former uh, sometimes you know it, it those are decisions I'm, I'm making all the time, and it's, mm-hmm. it's not easy. You know, hey, we're going out to dinner tonight. Yeah, I got to. Oh, okay. Oh. Hey, man, giving up your Saturdays is, a, is an easy thing when you're a Balls fan. <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's like, it's like and, and I'm a Dolphins fan, and we might be the worst team ever. Uh, but it's like, Ooh. hey, my, weekend, my weekends are free. Uh, load me up. Um, but no, it is. It's a great conversation to have, and, and again, we always appreciate it appreciate you tuning in and taking the time to listen to us we hope you have uh, gained some insight uh or even just some general reflection into your own training and where you want where you are now where you've been in the past and where you want to go uh if you haven't been or you have and it hasn't and it's been a while you can always go to crushingiron.com that is our one-stop shop for all things crushing iron uh it's got our information on coaching and training options uh camps swim analysis our blog gear uh, you name it, it's on there. It's a it's a awesome website with tons of info. Uh, if you have any specific questions for Mike, you can hit him up, crushingiron at gmail.com, or you can always reach out to me directly as well, c26coach at gmail.com. All right, buddy. All right. Sure. Yeah, man. Always. See you time. See you next time. Tap, 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 tap,